Hello and welcome to Brian Lomax Movie Talk. Sorry, I, I just I felt like going a bit northern there for a minute. Uh, yeah, it's Letterbox Sundays, everybody. Uh, it's been a while, but yeah, this is the show where I catch you up on what I've been watching with the help of my Letterbox Diary and also help from you guys over on Letterbox. First film is Detroit by Catherine Bigelow and Mark Ball. This is a, a pair that have teamed previously on two movies, uh, Zero Dark Thirty and The Hurt Locker. Hurt Locker obviously winning them a Oscar for Best Film. Uh, now... Yeah, Detroit. Can't say this was one that I was particularly enticed by when it when it came to the trailer. It looks it looked like it's going to be one of them hard hitting films, but maybe a bit depressing. Probably something I'm not going to want to watch repeatedly. Uh, the kind of thing film you have to be in the right mood for, really. A bit like Zero Dark Thirty. But with Zero Dark Thirty, it took me so long to get around to watching that film. But when I eventually watched it, oof, it was a staggering piece of work. I got to say, I still think. Catherine Bigelow's best of, of the recent films that, they, that that she's done with Mark Ball scripting. Um, but yeah, this is still really tense, really gripping stuff. Uh, now it's based on a true story, set on the de uh, around the Detroit riots, obviously, uh, but it's all about racism. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty evident right from the start that's what we're dealing with, that's what the film's about. Fine performances all round, all the cast really doing great work, um, but I, I just, I didn't really know much about this story, I've got to say, I've got to admit, uh, and just to learn of some of the things that happen here, I know there's a lot of controversy around this film, I mean, some people are even complaining that it's written and directed by white people, I, I, I don't care, you know, if, if you're a human being, you don't have to be black to be able to understand or relate to the atrocities that have been committed against black people at that time. I thought it was a really great film. Uh, I, I, I still think it probably is one that I'm not going to revisit on multiple occasions, but I still, on the flip side of that, think it's worthy of some Oscar attention come Oscar time. You know, un unless the tail end of this year is going to be filled with films that are much better than this, I definitely think it deserves attention. Aaron Gillingham says it's an intense and harrowing depiction of a truly horrific event. Perfect tone and great acting, especially from Will Poulter, who gave a career best performance, in my opinion. My only gripes is that there was a bit too much shaky cam at times, and the film could have benefited from having about 10 or so minutes cut off its running time. This is a complaint that I've read quite a bit on Letterboxd. Actually, when I was sifting through, I was looking for comments to put in this video. A lot of people seem to think that, yeah, the, the running time was a bit too much. For me personally, I didn't have a problem with it. I thought it was as long as it needed to be. I think we needed to kind of have a lot of this set up at the start to get us invested in these characters, to get to know who they are as people. Um, so that, yeah, so that when stuff starts kicking off and when some actually get killed, you really feel it. You really feel hit by it. I hear what you're saying about the shaky cam, though. Uh, I think that's something that is, is just indicative of modern cinema, to be honest. I, I think that these days, when you make a film about a real-life event, something that's quite tense, you can pretty much guarantee that the old shaky cam is going to come out. I think we can probably thank Paul Greengrass for that, for better or worse. It is one of them films that I feel is a must-watch. It's one that you, you kind of owe it to yourself to go out and watch, especially if you don't know much about this event. Uh, you know, get yourself educated. If you like to be put on the edge of your seat and if you like to go on a bit of a roller coaster ride uh, that, that you know is, is, is true, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, if you want to get close to this subject, obviously without being in it, this is about as close as, as you can come, really. Uh, so yeah, great job all round from the filmmaking team. I give Detroit a four and a half out of five. Next up is Cinderella Man. Uh, this is a film by Ron Howard, stars Russell Crowe and Renee Zellweger, and a really good British actor, actually, in, in the shape of Paddy Considine. This probably isn't his finest work, but he, he was kind of just getting going at this time. I think he works best when he's doing a lot of improv stuff. Look at anything he's done with Shane Meadows, some really great performances there. Uh, but yeah, this this is, no mistake, in this this is a Russell Crowe film. Uh, Paul Giamatti is very good in this as well. I like a good boxing movie. Now, you know, I, the problem with boxing movies, if, if there is a problem, is that they are going to follow similar tropes. The question is, 
whether they do that well and, and what do they bring to it that makes it feel fresh. And I think with this film, it's definitely the period setting. Uh, the period setting, the 1930s, definitely makes it feel fresh and very authentic. You know, it's not just a boxing move, movie, it's a period drama, it's a historical drama about the times, you know, about the depression, about what people were going through during these times and what they had to do to survive. Uh, and, and, and how that kind of era, the, you know, the, the time where, where they had nothing, often spurred some people on to do great things, to, 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 to get out of that situation. Uh, so we follow this boxer this guy called Braddock, um, who's actually retired from boxing, he's not boxing anymore, um, but obviously he's living in, living in the depression, can't really make a book for his family, so he gets back in the ring and before long ends up going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the world champion. And this is, again, this is a true story um, and, and I just, I like it, you know, it's a bit schmaltzy, it goes for it, that kind of audience. Um, if, you, if you don't like your schmaltz, you might not like this. But I think this is one of Ron Howard's most unsung films. I think it's one of his best films, actually. Even though it does follow a lot of tropes, like I say. You, you, you're not going to come out of this wondering where it's going, where, where's this leading, ooh. But that's not the point. The point is its execution. I think it's executed brilliantly. I think it's a fantastic performance from Russell Crowe. Again, one of his best, I think. And even Rene Zellweger is good in this. Um, Rene Zellweger actually is one of those actresses who, sh she is a good actress, but for some reason there's just something about her that kind of gets on my nerves. Um, but that, whatever that is about her that, that annoys me at times, doesn't seem to take over here. It, it doesn't seem to come to the fore. So it's, if you don't like Rene Zellweger, don't let that put you off watching this film because it is a cracker. I give it a four and a half out of five. Next up is the reimagining or new adaptation, remake, whatever you want to call it. I don't think it can be called a remake when it's based on a book because you're essentially just readapting the book, aren't you? Um, so it's not not necessarily a remake of the film, it's just another ad adaptation of Stephen King's It. Now obviously so many people have reviewed this already, talked about it till cows come home, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll throw in my two pennies worth. I did like this film a lot, uh, I thought it was very good, one of, the, one of the better horror movies we've had of late. Uh, it's mainly down to the characterizations of the the core group of kids that are in this. I really like their relationship, how it grows. Um, it feels very natural in the way that they get to know each other and and become this kind of solid group of friends. And it feels a lot like those films we know from the 80s, such as Stand By Me, uh, The Goonies and that kind of thing. Um, what I will say is that I do feel that some of the other characterizations feel a little bit over-egged, particularly the bully in this. Um, it just feels so full-on that they, they go a little bit overboard, a little bit over the top with it. Um, I like what it has to say about bullies and how, you know, you look at this guy's life, you look at his family and how, how his dad is essentially bullying him and you see how it's passed down, that kind of behaviour infects other people and, and, and they, and they you know, bullies be, uh, create bullies, so to speak. So I like all that stuff. I just feel like they over it too much. They went too far. Like, you know, when you've got a scene in which someone is carving with a knife into another kid's stomach and grown-ups are just wandering past in a car and they don't stop to help, that to me just, it, it's too much. It's over the top. Um, I get where they're going with it because I believe in the book there is more explanation there but that explanation isn't given in the film you know we're told about in the book I believe we're told about why these the adults in this town don't kind of stop don't intervene when this kind of behavior is going on you know they become complacent they become whatever and it's obviously all relating back to Pennywise and his influence on this town but that isn't conveyed in the film so all we see in the film is the fact that these people, these adults, just drive on by. And, and yeah, it to me, something like that, if you're going to put that in, I want a bit more explanation. I want to know, okay, why are these adults the way they are? It, it just took me out a little bit. Another thing I will say that I don't feel many people, well, I don't think anyone's commented on, I've certainly not read it, anything on it or, or heard anyone speak about it. And it's a tricky subject to get into because, yeah, 
it's just a hard one to talk about but we'll just we'll, I'll just come right out and say it and that's the camera work on some of the scenes that I, I personally feel is inappropriate now the, the, the one I'm scene I'm particularly thinking of is the scene where the losers club are all together uh, they've just been jumping in, in into this lake uh, whatever you call it uh, reservoir I think and the guys are all oogling the, the girl I can't remember her name but they're all making eyes at her they're all they're all kind of yeah perving on her basically she's laid there on a rock with just a bikini on and and they're perving at her and, and that's fine you know that like kids that age are gonna do that I get that show us that show us that that's what they're doing but my problem with that scene is the way the camera lingered on the girl and then put us the audience into their perspective for a little bit too long I feel uh, and, and in a way that for me felt uncomfortable because it got to the point where you suddenly realize actually we, we're lingering here we're, we're, our, our eye, we're, we're being asked to let our eyes linger on this 14 year old girl in a rather sexual way to me I had a problem with that uh, I, I think they could have done that scene they could have conveyed the information they were trying to convey in that scene a lot better um, that is my primary complaint with the film. Beyond that, everything else I thought was done really well. Uh, great performance uh, from Skarsgård as Pennywise. And like I say, all the kids that, that made up the Losers Club were really good. And some genuinely good scares as well. Possibly too many jump scares for my liking. Uh, I think on repeat viewing this may not hold up as well. I think I still, still think it will hold up pretty good because it does have that character you know which is one of the most important films things you can give me in a film uh, but I think some of the jump scares will probably lose their impact once I know they come in uh, but beyond that yeah very good film Troy says I absolutely loved this movie from the beginning to the end I didn't get scared at all while watching this but that never bothered me one bit because for one I'm used to horror jump scares creepy settings or so-called disturbing imagery and for two I was just enjoying the story of the Losers Club, aka the Lovers Club, so much that I wasn't even looking for a jump scare. It felt like I was watching a new Goonies film, which is a great thing. Yeah, you know, that's exactly what I was talking about. It, it does have that vibe, it does have that feel. If you like those movies, I think if you grew up in the 80s watching those kind of movies, this film is definitely going to have that nostalgia factor for you. It's definitely going to take you back there. Um, but I do think this is a vast improvement on a lot of those films. The original uh, It included. I think this does a better job. And I like actually the fact as well that they keep these core group of characters kids. They stay children throughout the movie. You know, One of the things about the, the, the other version is that we see them face It at the end as adults. And for me that was always a bit of a mistake because... You know, this this thing got into them, made them afraid as kids, and I always felt like their journey into adulthood should be this this idea of them facing their fears as teenagers. That's that's when they stop being children and become adults. Uh, so to, to yeah, to have them go back as adults for me was always a bit of a mistake. Uh, something they fix in this film. So I give it four out of five. Next up is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into this, I'll read a couple of comments, but I just want to say that when I first reviewed this on my channel way back when, when it came out, um, I gave it like the equivalent of 4 out of 5, and that was primarily because of something in it that I felt um, hadn't been explained. And it was only when I watched it on repeat viewing that I realised they had explained it. I just, I don't know, I must have been sleeping during that point or whatever, I must, I must have zoned out because, uh, yeah, it's perfectly explained, uh, which kind of really bumps it up for me. And I've watched it again recently, hence the reason for it being in this video, and it's just so much fun, you know? It's, this is one of the best Marvel movies, I've got to say. Each time I watch it, it goes up in my estimation. Uh, and the, the criticisms I had in my original review no longer stand. Uh, because like I say, the only criticism I had was the, the lack of explanation for something that actually was explained. Foz Rotten on Letterboxd simply says, perfect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not quite sure I'm there yet, but to be honest, what, what defines a perfect film? A, a film that can't be criticised, I guess. I don't know. I, I mean, I believe that 
any film can be if, if you look hard enough i think sometimes it's just a feeling I, I for some reason i can't quite give this the full-on five i can't quite call it perfect and i don't know why um but i had an awful lot of fun with it this time round. i must say now, Graham Davidson said, simply put, this is the best movie that Marvel has released yet. Right from the start, this film wears its heart on its sleeve when introducing the young Peter Quill in his most vulnerable of moments. From then on, dazzles you with its quirky characters and sparkling dialogue. I could go on to list my favourite moments in this movie, but it would just be a transcript of the film. This is the movie I've had the most fun with in the cinema for years. I can't recommend it enough. I'll be seeing this a few more times. Yeah, pretty much sums it up. Uh, it is just a heck of a lot of fun. And it's the characters, this core group of characters, these five characters are all so well defined, all so well rounded. Um, and they just bring so much to the team. They're all, they're all so different, that's the thing. They all bring these different qualities. Uh, so yeah, I, I love these characters. Uh, I love the humour in it. It's handled perfectly. Like nearly all the jokes kind of hit the mark in this. But it does also have this really touching, affecting story about family. Uh, for me, it gets a four and a half out of five. Which brings me on to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. Uh, yeah, because I, you know, I picked up the the box set, and this is another one that actually, if I could go back to my review, I would probably change it. Uh, yeah, I, I think I was more generous to this film than I should have been in my original review. I still think it's a very good film. I still think it's very humorous, but I've got a feeling that with repeat viewings that opinion may change even more uh, i didn't like this as much as i did on on the first viewing now, the first time i watched this i found it hysterical i had such a good time with it uh, you know i went with a friend we both reviewed it on my channel and yeah we loved it watching it this time around uh, i gotta say a lot of the jokes didn't quite hit the mark the way they did the first time and there are some scenes where they i i, I I had I had a conversation actually with uh, Luke Ryan from Razorwire Reviews uh, when it came out. All the re everyone was doing the reviews and stuff, and he pointed something out, which to be honest didn't bother me in the film. I didn't notice it, but only after he pointed it out and I watched it this time, he's so spot on. Which is that the moment when uh, Peter Quill is and there's spoilers here, so if you don't want it spoiling, if you're not seeing this yet and you don't want it spoiling, zip on to the next film review because if you go down at the bottom I have time codes for, for each of the reviews so if you don't want to listen to this one hop to the next one but yeah there's a scene where Peter Quill is told by his dad that uh, that, that his, his dad says when I gave your mother can cancer and it's this really flippant comment that's just thrown out there that suddenly goes punch you know you realize damn he's the guy who killed his mother you know, this, this event in his life that pretty much shaped who he is as a person. Um, and then it's just brushed aside with a joke. That was a moment that should not have been brushed aside with a joke. It's a moment that should have been left to linger and should have really affected these characters. Uh, you know, that, that should have been the darkest moment in the film. Uh, so, yeah, I totally agree with Luke and where he was coming from on that. And like I say, just second time around watching this, it, it feels quite bloated um and 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 yeah like i say a lot of the jokes don't quite hit the mark now i still give this quite a high mark because don't get me wrong i did have a lot of fun with this i had a, a, a really good time with it but this isn't as good as the first one no chance no chance is this as good as the first one um and, and like i say the first one keeps going up in my estimation and i've got a feeling this one will keep going down someone who pointed a lot of this stuff out way back when when the film came out i say way back it was a few months when it uh, is Lee McCoy, aka Drumdums, and he says with his two-star review, who likes controversial opinions? Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is the worst MCU movie yet, and I never thought I would make that claim. Some funny moments, sure, but what's left? Weak core character moments, cliche Marvel villain, massive CGI fests, and wasted new character opportunities. Loved the first Guardians. This was a travesty. Shame. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm quite there yet. I'm not quite at that level. But I totally hear what Lee is saying there. Because um, 
yeah, just I mean, a lot of what he said is just true. Uh, now, I, I will say, however, I'm, I, I don't think it's devoid of great character moments. What I did love about this film, uh, first time and second time around, in fact, was the stuff between Gamora and Nebula. Um, and I, a lot of people don't seem to kind of point that out. They don't seem to touch on that as, a, as, as, a, as an aspect of the film. It didn't seem to grab them. But for me, it did. This idea of the, the two of them and why they fight all the time, or what, certainly why Nebula is always going after Gamora all the time, um, it, it, that, that actually touched me quite a lot. Um, and I, I, to me, thought that was one of the most emotional kind of threads throughout the movie, was this relationship between Gamora and Nebula. Um, I, I, I don't feel like the villain was quite as cliched as... as uh, as Lee points out, I, I think he's an interesting character, or could have been, like I say, had they be, had a few more of those moments, the, the more darker, more serious moments, been allowed to breathe a bit and not been kind of off-cut with a joke. Uh, but yeah, like I say, I still got a lot out of this film, still a lot of fun, but not a patch on the first one. I give it a four out of five. Next up is Calvary. Now, I've talked a, bit, a lot about this film in the past. I think it's a staggering piece of work. I really do. Uh, I watched it again recently, and it, it still holds up. I love it. Uh, for me, if, if you've not seen the film, it's about this priest who, right at the beginning of the film, someone comes into his confession box and says, look, Father, I know you're a good man. I know you're a good priest. That's why I've picked you. I'm going to kill you. You got seven days to get your house in order. Meet me on the beach, and I'm going to kill you there and then. Uh, you know that that's it. And then the rest of the film, this this priest is dealing with people in his in his, his parish, and basically any one of them could be the person who's going to kill him. Um, what does he do with that? You know, and the the film is basically a parable for the for the life of Jesus and for how we as Christians, or if if you have a faith, that is, um, should live. Uh, and and this 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 guy kind of demonstrates many of the facets uh, of of Jesus and and how he taught us to live. Um, you know, the, the the film is called Calvary, which is the place where Jesus was crucified. Um, Jesus knew he was going to his death and yet went anyway and that's what this guy does you know he, he he could run you know and at one point in the film he does you know you could think of that as his moment in Gethsemane his moment of doubt should he run or not um, but he doesn't he, he carries on uh, the march to Calvary so to speak uh, and you know at one point he has a gun you know so he, he could take that with him and he could defend himself you, you know if you think about how that relates to the power that Jesus had why don't you pull yourself off the cross he could at any time because of the power that he had but he didn't the father in this film he throws that gun away uh, you know and, and it was actually meant for another purpose but like I say the fact that he has his hands on it means he could take it with him, means he could defend himself, but he chooses not to. And the film is really all about forgiveness. He goes to his death willingly, essentially. Um, and as a result of that, the final moment of the film, again, if you don't want it spoiling, if, if, you've, if you've not seen this and it intrigues you and you want to go and see it, um, click on the next video down below. Uh, but yeah, he, you know, in his actions, he allows himself to be shot essentially and that moment that 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 kind of willing sacrifice so to speak it leads to the final moment in the film which is his daughter going to see this guy who's killed her dad and in that moment you get the sense that she is going there to forgive him and the reason you get that sense is because of the last conversation that she had with her father on the phone about forgiveness um, and yeah it's just it's it's a brilliant film. It's an absolutely brilliant parable, um, you know. And there's, there's a scene in it. That, you know, this this guy isn't perfect. The character played by Brendan Gleeson isn't perfect. And there's a moment in the film when he he shouts at one of his fellow priests and swears. He gets really aggressive towards him because this guy just he upsets him and he goes off on one. Um, and for me, that's that. If, if you want to read a correlation to to the life of Jesus, it's the turning over of the ta the tables in the temple. You know, this this is an, another guy. This this other priest. He's supposed to be a man of God. He's supposed to be a man of virtue. He's supposed to be a man who embodies the qualities of Jesus within this world amongst his parishioners. 
and he doesn't and and that angers this priest and like i say i i relate that to the moment where jesus turns over the the tables in the temple there's so much in this film uh, that is just for me as a christian it's just brilliant. Greg Newman says it's a sin that Brendan Gleeson is not Oscar nominated for this gut-wrenching performance. Could not agree with you more. Absolutely brilliant performance. He's practically in every scene of this film. I say practically, I think he is. I don't think there's a single scene in this film that he's not in, so he carries it. James Patrick says I'm still feeling the drain and attempting to put the pieces together. Not of the narrative, however. There are no twists and tricks. The first seconds of the movie tell you what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. It never deviates. Consider fate. Consider the nagging intervention of randomness and chaos with which these characters struggle despite various levels of faith and faithlessness. Who's good? Who's evil? Who's wrong? Or right? The answer to all questions, I think, is all of us. Yeah, I mean, this, this film is really dealing with sin, and that's one of the other aspects of the film, is that each of these parishioners that this, this priest meets kind of embodies a different form of sin, a different form of evil. Uh, and how does he confront that? How does he deal with it? And at times, it's a real struggle. At times, he doesn't know how to. This guy isn't perfect. You know, and as much as this guy, as a character, embodies what Jesus stood for in many ways, like I say, he's not perfect and he fails it at times. He, you know, he gets it wrong at times. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a staggering achievement. Uh, I, I think there's there's a lot here to chew on. I don't think you have to be a Christian to get something out of it. Um, you know, there's, there's there's much in here that you that you can read into the film. Uh, so yeah, for me, it's a perfect score. It's a five out of five. And I think it's one of the best films of the last 10 years. Next up is a film called The Hunter, starring Willem Dafoe. He plays, well, a hunter who goes into this environment supposedly to hunt down this animal that is extinct. Uh, one has been sighted, apparently, and he's been sent to find it uh, by a, a company that essentially just want to harvest something from it that they can then turn into a weapon uh, that they can use and sell or whatever uh, so yeah very devious um, but he he comes across the family of the previous man who was sent to track this thing down and then kind of a relationship starts with him and this family and and yeah you know what it i see a very good film in here somewhere but I feel like maybe it, it wasn't quite found uh, by the, the people who were making it. Um, still a great performance from Willem Dafoe, and I still like the relationship that he that his character has with this family. I, I like how that evolves, and uh, there's some pretty dark twists along the way that you don't see coming uh, that you know that make it a very watchable film but not something I would probably repeat. Um, it, it's a bit slow in parts, too slow for my liking. I like slow burn character driven movies, um, but they have to have something else about them that this film, for whatever reason, just doesn't have. I think it's there's a coldness about this film. It's very clinical. There's a lot of scenes in which we have Willem Dafoe out in the wilderness, essentially just looking at things. And, and, and yeah, so maybe not quite as good as it should have been. Uh, I give it a three out of five. Um, worth a watch, but not a repeat watch. Next up is Justice League Dark. Uh, yeah, this is the film that brings together some of the more darker, magical type characters from DC Comics and forms a, a kind of, yeah, a darker version of the Justice League. Um, so you've got Swamp Thing, you've got Zatanna, you've got Constantine, um, uh, the Demon, uh, Etrigan the Demon. Yeah, uh, you know, it, a group of characters that, for the most part, I, I think Etrigan and Zatanna I've had more experience with. I kind of like the, them, um, depending on you know where I've seen them. Uh, they, they, they can hit different marks depending on who's writing them as characters and whatnot uh constantine i you know I, I didn't like the keanu reeves movie i i understand that that was nothing like the actual comic book character so 
I, yeah, I, I just it's I'm a bit muddled with this film. I don't like magic. That's the thing. That's the key. If I'm being bl bluntly honest, this film deals heavily in magic and the dark arts and, and that kind of thing. That's that stuff to me. Not interested. Uh, you know, I, surprisingly, I liked Doctor Strange, um, and I went into that film with great trepidation because I, I, like I say, I just don't like that stuff. The mystic arts, all that nonsense. It usually puts me right off. Um, this isn't a bad film, like I say, but just w when when your action is kind of geared around that kind of stuff, around the magic stuff, it doesn't make for very interesting visual um, battles, I would say, particularly in animation. Uh, maybe more so with live action, but in animation, when you're having two people going up against each other and their main kind of battle skill is some kind of magical power, there's no way to animate that in a way that is is as satisfying as, say, two characters just getting together and pummeling each other with their fists. Uh, you know, Call me adolescent or whatever, but that's just the way I feel. When you see people shooting things out of their fingertips, rays and, and, and auras and all that crap, it just it doesn't excite me uh, as far as as far as animation goes. You know, there's, there's not much there to work with. Um, that being said, you know, it's, it's an interesting enough story. Uh, like I say, I just I'm, I'm just not grabbed by by the magic element. Uh, there you go. I give it a three out of five. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff in here with Batman. Many ent entertaining moments with Batman, um, and I think that's really what kind of keeps me on board the film for the most part. I, I, Constantine's quite interesting as a character as well. I think he's got some attitude, um, but yeah, there you go. Bit mixed. Three out of five. Still good. Still worth a watch. It's better than some DC animated movies. I'll put it that way. Next up is Underworld Blood Wars. Saw this film when it first came out. Reviewed it. Gave it a three out of five. Thought it was quite entertaining. Mainly because there's lots of action in it. Watching it again. Second time around. Didn't hold up so well. Fake Shemp on Letterboxd says, I had a little nap. Woke up and Celine had highlights. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> kind of sums it up really. Because... As much as that's just like a throwaway quip, it it's kind of highlights what this film is concerned with, which is things looking cool. You know, that's pretty pretty much like most of the films in this franchise. I do think this franchise is better than Resident Evil, say, but it's hardly a huge step up. You know, um, it just it's it's far too concerned with how cool everyone looks. Uh, you know, everyone walking around in matrix style clothing all the leathers and you know let's bring celine back from the dead even though we've not told anybody why she's come back from the dead and we're not even we're just not going to explain it at all but hey we'll give her a cool white highlights and it, yeah it's stuff like that it's just perhaps if you concentrated more on the explanations of things and why things are happening rather than on making your characters look cool you might have a better film. Uh, yeah, like I said, I gave this three stars when it first came out. It's kind of come down a bit since then. I give it two and a half. Joshua Drake on Letterboxd also gives it two and a half. He says it's a good movie, could have been a little better, but still passable. B plus. Yeah, it, like I said, if you're an action junkie, then y you're going to get something out of this. I, I think there's there's some interesting characters. There's a lot more characters in this than the usual Underworld films. They set up a lot of different villains and different strands, uh, a lot of double crosses and stuff. And that keeps me intrigued enough to go along with it. Um, but yeah, on the whole, could have done better. So finally, we get Magic Beyond Words, the J.K. Rowling story. This feels like a TV movie, which is exactly what it is. It stars Poppy Montgomery, an Australian actress that most people will probably know from the TV series Without a Trace. I think she's a very good actress, and I think there are many times in this film where she shows that she is a very good actress. There's a particular moment when she, she's obviously playing J.K. Rowling. Uh, Rowling is having an argument with her husband. Um, you know, for anyone who knows the, the story of Rowling, she, she was married, uh, the, the marriage failed, and she became a single parent. Well, this guy was a complete douchebag by all accounts. That's shown in this film. And that scene in which they, they kind of part ways, 
is really well done uh, with regards to the performances. The two actors, and particularly, as I say, Poppy Montgomery in this, really does well with it with that performance with the script um, but it's just a shame that on the whole the script doesn't give them much else to work with um, so yeah I, 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 I think it's, it's just it's just suffers really from one not having any involvement from Rowling herself you know this isn't something that's been endorsed by her which I always find a bit weird, you know, when when a film like this can get made, even though the person that it's based on is still alive and they have no involvement in it. That to me is just a bit weird and should probably set a few alarm bells ringing straight off the bat when you go in to watch it. Um, you know what? It's like I say, it's if you caught this on TV one night and you knew it was a made for TV movie, you might get something out of it. Uh, but when you kind of put it alongside the movies I've discussed here which are you know proper movies that have gone to the cinema then you're going to find it extremely wanting there's just there's not much drama in it there's not much tension there's not much conflict you know well, other, other than the stuff with her husband which is probably the most interesting aspect of the film because that puts conflict in there you find that throughout the rest of it the filmmakers are really struggling to put moments of conflict in, moments of tension. Um, and it kind of feels in the end like a highlights moment of things that we know about J.K. Rowling. You know, things that have been in the press, things that have been talked about already in the media. It's a collection of those events put together in a film. Uh, yeah, so I give it a two out of five. And there you go, that is this episode of Letterboxd Sundays. The five star film is Calvary, that is the one I would most recommend out of all these films I've talked about. But what about you? From these films, which is your favourite? Which ones have you seen and which ones did you like or dislike? Comment below, let me know and until next time, cracking.